Now, over the years, you've probably tried different investments in stocks and mutual funds, so you know they can be quite unpredictable. But with inflation running at its highest rate for 40 years, do you want volatility and uncertainty? Being able to sleep at night knowing your investment isn't about to crash is worth its weight in gold. And speaking of gold, if you've been jumping from one investment idea to the next, a gold IRA with Noble Gold might be the thing for you. A reliable hedge against inflation just fell in our laps. With gold, you shield your gains from taxes, you keep the real value of your wealth, you own a global asset, something tangible, and you can help protect your wealth against an economic crash. So what's not to like? And this month, for every IRA above 20k, you'll get an incredible 3 silver American virtue coin completely free as a thank you. Call 877-646-5347 now to find out more or visit noblegoldinvestments.com. Again, that's noblegoldinvestments.com. Hey, hey, Inspired Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers. How's it going? Welcome to another Inspired Conversation. And for those of you who've been with us for a while, this is going to be a familiar guest by now. The one and only filmmaker, researcher, truth seeker, and friend of the Inspire channel, Frank Jacob. Frank, thank you so much for joining us again today. How are you doing, John? Good to be back. Uh, Very good. It's always great to have a conversation with you. Frank, you have a big announcement today, which I look very much forward to sharing with our wonderful viewers. But before we do that, um, people have been asking, because our previous conversations were triggered by an article you wrote a couple months ago. And this was on a German speaking platform. We both speak German as well. And I read this article and I did something that I usually don't do. I immediately reached out um, to the person running the platform, whom we both know, a friend of ours, Jan, and said, who's this Frank Jacob guy that wrote this article? I want to interview him. And what you wrote um, was basically you broke the story on the Guardians of the Looking Glass, this mysterious group that showed up a couple of months ago and put out these videos talking about two timelines, uh, two future timelines. One, if we want to break it down, very positive for humanity, one very negative for humanity. And you broke this in a way that I felt was very eye-opening, very consciousness uh, expanding. And that's why I thought it would be wonderful to have you on. People have really resonated with what you have shared. And so now um, for those who haven't really explored this topic, we'll put the links up here or up here and down there so you can watch your previous interviews with Frank and get caught up on on the Looking Glass story. But for those who are already in the subject and know what we're talking about, Frank, what has happened since our last conversation? What information could you gather? Because another date has passed and people are asking, Who's, where's Dr. Wu? Is he fine? Uh, you know, is he alive? And what's what's the newest on that? Well, it seems like the, the conversation has moved on to the Raindrop Dao forum uh, because essentially we know that the fourth video of the Looking Glass Guardians came out after the April event. And, you know, they've kind of gone quiet and there's a lot of um, speculation about what's really going on. There, there was this guy, Marshall Masters, that released a video saying, putting the whole thing into, uh, they're not even real anymore, they've been hijacked and whatever. And so I started looking around at the, obviously the rain do- dropped out, it's something I've been following because I'm just trying to find for myself, just like a lot of, a lot of other people, um, you know, trying to grasp at bits of information to figure out. One question has always been, the, you know, how authentic is the message? How, how legitimate is it? How real is it? All these things. And so you look, and, and there, there was an article about um, Dr. Wu and Winston Wu, and some people sent me some very unusual <laughs> Winston Wu kind of, you know, bits like videos and weird things. Um, so, you know, the, the question's always been to determine, you know, is this thing going to do something positive? Because you know the worst thing is that you you invest your energy and and time into something and then it just turns out to be a misleader and so many in the awakening community have been so disappointed they've become kind of apathetic and we don't want that to happen and for me it's never really been from the start like we talked earlier strictly about you know being a guardian of the looking glass fanboy you know it's about breaking that story what does it mean what do timelines mean and I think we achieved that. I think we actually hijacked that conversation, put it into the direction of consciousness and timelines. And so going over to the 
Raindrop DAO site, you find some interesting messages. One of the things that's happened is that a lot of beta testers have come on board because there's there's now an urgency because of the uh, us having kind of kiboshed the April 18th event, the sort of, you know, the elite dark timeline people have had to shuffle their plans and they're not going to just kind of pull their tail between their legs and go running off. These people are hardcore and they're going to keep going and we're seeing that in the world around us. So they're going to try to accelerate. And that's some of the messaging that's been coming up on those boards about how they are. Um, I think I have one of them here. Let's see if I can find it and I'll put it on screen. Exactly. It says essentially that they're basically um, they're changing things and pushing up some timeline, like trying to accelerate stuff that was planned years from now uh, because they want to ha make it happen right now. And of course, you know, that's kind of dangerous because, you know, they have a lot more resources on at their disposal than, than we do. And in fact, and just the whole Winston Moo thing, of course, was an unanswered question. And just to pop that up on the screen, too, we can see that, you know, on the, the 21st, after the 20th, which is the day that Wu was supposedly going to be assassinated, we get this tweet. And uh, apparently, you know, there's been, yeah, he's, um, he's essentially been... Uh, He's in good health. And I was always wondering kind of what that means, you know, to be in good health. And, uh, you know, the only thing that I could uh, find other than that was that there was this one post that was put up by one of the admins that says, yes, he's OK. But it, there was this heavy scene that went down and he says, let me see if I can read it here. I can't talk about it all yet, but soon the world will know what they tried to do to him. It's a serious crime attempting kidnapping of one of Dr. Wu's assistants and attempted murder of Dr. Wu. I believe a divine force was in place to protect Dr. Wu and his team, and I believe that because there were some local law enforcement who we thought were bad guys but turned out to be good guys who helped us, we were, you know, we were lucky and we're still in shock. And what's really sad is that they are, they are now being targeted. And apparently one of them has been killed who had a family. So it's... There's this, all this heavy stuff going on, right? And so, I mean, I think it's far from over. Um, but uh, one of the other messages that they talked about was because of this urgency to bring people on board, the reason behind it was is that they actually found that in Bitcoin, there was some, there was like some kind of a, um, what did they call it? A worm of some kind that was put in. And uh, if they would have edited that um, that particular batch of Bitcoin, they would have destroyed their entire project. And they caught it just in time, but it set them back and it forced them to have to think about alternatives to um, to work with cryptocurrency. Because for those who don't know, right, the whole point is, and I, I'll just say this first of all as a caveat, and I, I think it speaks for you too. We're not trying to get people to go on to Raindrop DAO and buy cryptocurrency. We're, we're not affiliated. Never been, never been the, the, the goal. But and because I myself have been watching crypto for some time, I'm still not prepared to jump into it because I think, for me, the problem has always been it's digital, and if you know something in the world happens, God forbid, like all the power goes out and or the internet crashes. Well, and you've got all your money in Bitcoin. What are you going to do? I mean, how are you going to get your money out if it's all digitized and you have no access to digital connections? Well, to me that and, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I have invested in some Bitcoin to, you know, fully be transparent here, but not not in, in the form of, of the raindrop DAO. But um, w one thing that to me was always a setback is we have tried and we are still really working on keeping real life value and and currencies and things that we can still exchange in a physical form if we put everything in a digital digital world that's exactly what they want us to do in the first place so that's why i i have hesitation and reservations just like you absolutely and i think that that's uh, the point is here that the feds at some point um are going to make it difficult for any other crypto to exist except for the ones that they've authorized. That's kind of a no brainer, right? I mean, if you think about currencies, right? I don't know if you've ever done much research into currencies and the financial system. Yes. A, a couple of decades ago, I think you have, yeah. A couple of dec decades ago, I was totally into all this stuff. And I found out that, you, you know, whatever- At the same time. 
Yeah, probably. I think we're soul brothers, mate. But uh, when I'm thinking about what, whenever there was a successful alternative currency in a local market, what happened? They shut it down because there can only be one legitimate, you know, th their legitimate currency. So they let it play for a while. And I think a lot of these things, they experiment, they let other people do the experimentation. It's kind of like those superstar singer shows, you know, the, yeah. the talent shows. Like they don't need to you know, spend any more money on a and they can just have some stupid show and have all these people come on board and then they, you know, they get the audience to pay for all their A&R and then they just get their stars, you know. It's just like the Fed will take some kind of a currency experiment, watch it, and then when it's successful, they will hijack it and squash out the resistance. And this is something which could happen with crypto. And I think that Dr. Wu's team know this and they talk about this on their forum. And so their idea is to get in there use the quantum computer which he's you know it's another subject about the quantum computers but quantum computers have entered have introduced a whole new form of computing into the world and quantum computers have the ability to crack even crypto uh keys and uh, in fact that was announced i think last time we one of the shows we did i even put on the screen um, an article of how they in 2020 were already able to crack them so they essentially, you know, they're going to crack them at some point. So the, the point is not to get involved in cryptocurrency for the sake of being involved in cryptocurrency, but to get the grip, cryptocurrency converted into tangible assets. And, and as far as I understand, Wu's message and mission has always been to use those um, tangible assets to actually make an impact in the real world. Meaning, you know, maybe you have all kinds of money to back a certain political candidate who stands for, you know, the things that are more in tune with where we want to go in the world, as opposed to this transhumanist concept, but a more humanist ideology. Maybe it's uh, some kind of an energy platform, free energy or something like that. They're pushing that. And it's always been very difficult as a candidate to run up against the Trumps and the Bidens because those people are loaded. And they're, you know, they're millionaires and they have the backing of millionaires. And if you want to come in as an outsider, you need cash. Unfortunately, if you want to play in that arena, that's the only way you can do it. And as far as I understand, that's always been kind of Wu's, um, you know, and his team's approach. Uh, so, you know, let's let's pray for them that they succeed. And they're saying that something is happening. There's been kind of a crypto war with um, Nancy Pelosi and Soros and BlackRock having entities there. They're behind that are doing an all out attack on crypto so that they are actually going to try and bring it crashing down. Well, they I even give it a date I, I, quickly into that. And then I have a follow up question. But I think what we have seen is um, over the past years, a constant push and pull for legislation to regulate crypto more. And I think uh, my, my very cynical thought here is I don't think uh, the politicians were quite ready to do it because they had so much dirty money and, 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 and bribe payments and whatnot and kickbacks in, in crypto. Everybody for the past 10 years was paid in Bitcoin uh, for, you know, for good and bad stuff. Let's let's face it. That's yes. Know. Black uh, because crypto has been always kind of associated with a dark web. And and yes. And and, and for a reason, because it, it really is. It was the preferred currency for a while. I think now that there's so much heat on it, they're starting to pull out of it and and, you know, kind of put their assets elsewhere. But I want to jump two steps back. You said something very important. And um, which which brings us to the timelines. But what you said is the conversation here, not just us, but us as well. And everything that's going on around this subject um, is continually as soon as we hit. And this is my this is now intuitively speaking. As soon as we hit a, a point, a spot, you know, like when you're over the target. We can watch how in the outside world things are intensifying and how an acceleration is happening. Now, you said that's dangerous on the one side. Yes, it's true, because nefarious stuff is happening. People are dying and suffering is happening. But on the flip side of this, every time this happens, more and more people are, are literally pulled out of their slumber and see things for what they are. And now this is this has gone so deep into the population that I think when they say we need to accelerate, go faster, go harder, the opposite is really happening. People are pulling out, pulling out, pulling out. Do you think do you think that when we are over the target, when we talk about these things, and especially when we connect it to a positive vision, which is our intent always, do you think that they get triggered to make more mistakes, go faster, and actually bury themselves? 
I, I mean, I would have to say yes to that because I mean, it's it is it is a game in a way, and every every one of us are players uh, to the extent that and, and to the level that you know that we've um, we've familiarized ourselves with the the rules of the game, and the longer we've been in in the for example in the whole idea of disclosure or awakening or, or you know just getting in touch with the higher consciousness material, um, the more power we have and the more um, resonance that we put out into the, the field. And they're all connected to that field as well. So they must feel it. And they know that, uh, I think there's even, I remember some quote by um, Zerbigno Brzezinski about how, a, you know, a few years, maybe even going back eight or 10 years at some Bilderberg meeting saying, you know, people are are waking up, and you know it's dangerous because people are getting conscious, and we won't. We only have so much time to pull off our agenda. So I absolutely believe that because if we didn't believe that, there would really not be much hope for us being able to turn the tables any longer. You know, but, and, but I, and then, I do I do want to focus on that hope just for a moment, and then go into the timelines because this is really where your big announcement comes in. The hope, and more than hope, inspiration is, and this is what I want all of our viewers and listeners today really to reflect on is how far we've come. And Frank, you, you said something. You've been researching probably for decades in different areas. And, and interestingly enough, when you research long enough and when you have a hard connection to what you do, you feel that everything is connected and everything leads to one singular topic. And that is all of this crap can only happen if we're disconnected from who we really are. Once we, we step into that power, you cannot control us anymore. That's the whole game, right? And so, so many people feel this connection, establish it more frequently, or never even lose it anymore again. So I want to just emphasize the positive here and how much has already happened and how you can today walk into a supermarket and have a conversation with the cashier that blows your mind, whereas 20 years ago, you had to look for people hard to find a few people who could actually communicate with you about these things because the knowledge and the connection wasn't there. So we've come a long way. Now, I, I do want to say that, as we said in the beginning, you have a big announcement. I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, you've Since we've last spoken in between, in the back, you, you've you kind of closed yourself off a little bit from the outside world and went into creation mode. And you've created something quite amazing, I believe, that is very, very valuable. Uh, to the world. Let us know what's been going on in Frank Jacobs' world while you were shut off from the outside world a little bit. Well, it, it's all it's it's all because of you know having opened my big mouth on, on one of the shows that we did about a, about something <laughs> I called a webinar. Right? I didn't at the time really know that there was going to be a lot of people watching, and I just kind of thought, yeah, you know, I've noticed that a lot of the content on your um, platform is higher consciousness oriented and, and and goes into some of these forbidden territories. And I've got a ton of that stuff. So, hey, we should do a webinar. And I'm like, okay. And then everyone, I started getting people writing emails, like hundreds of people saying, yeah, let's do a, a webinar. And I'm like, oh my God, I actually have to do this now. <laughs> so I was faced with having to find a platform to do a webinar on and, and having to kind of design all that that worked and that was trustworthy and and then I and then the idea of the webinar itself, I was OK, I, I wanted to definitely uh, develop the Guardians of the Looking Glass um, topic, um, but more broader, broader, the whole Looking Glass topic in it in itself. And as you know, I'm a filmmaker and usually I, I make a film, but making a film can take years and it, it's 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 time consuming and tedious. And and I'm really still I'm actually still doing the same kind of research. But by the time I get into a, a vehicle with a camera or travel across to another continent and find people, so much time has gone by. And I don't feel, I feel right now we've entered a phase where we don't have years to wait. We have to get this information out there. And um, so I started to kind of, and I've been doing, you know, after, after we released Packing for Mars and Solar Revolution and, you know, all these films, we started doing, you know, uh, compensating the... Um, the film screenings with live presentations where we go into the making of, where we bring in a lot of other information that we couldn't put into the film, which was also equally fascinating and brings in a lot of other facets. So for me, the webinar was like, okay, I want to do a webinar about this looking glass, but I want to make it all encompassing. It has to be something which ties together 
uh, connects all the dots and brings in elements of consciousness. And we, like you said before, we are no longer in the same place that we were in 10 years ago, even, you know, 10 years was that critical date, 2012, uh, you know, December 21st, 2012. And a lot of people thought there was going to be some mass awakening and it didn't happen. So there was a lot of apathy and discouragement. But the fact is something really huge did happen that year. It just wasn't reported. And um, that actually has had an effect on our consciousness since then, ever since. And the Maya talked about the Hunabku being this ray coming from the center of the galaxy. And all of this stuff is happening. And um, But no one's ever really put all of that together in context with the looking glass, people that were looking at timelines and probability ratios and trying to figure out how can we manipulate something to work in our favor. Um, and the scary part was that they were, according to the guardians of the looking glass, seeing that all timelines were still going to end up in their favor. And I thought about that a long time and how does that work? And so, you know, the, the webinar is ends up being like a whole day. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I can't, it's not one part, it's three parts and they're like several hours long. And so because it's like a day workshop in a way, but it's a download because it goes into not only the, all the different important key elements of the history of the looking glass and the, who the participants and key players were, but also like, you know, some of the deeper material that was associated with it, with the J rods, for example, mm -hmm. because, you know, the whole looking glass never would have come into existence without us having made contact with these future humans. And they left for us incredible information. And that's really rarely ever been disclosed to the public. So what we're going through now is like, I'm going through and I'm just mining this stuff and trying to put as much as I can into a very digestible and easy to understand package so that you get the gist of it, which will not just give you, like we said earlier, like, a okay, it's cool to talk about the secret space program and UFOs and makes you feel like you know something no one else does. But for me personally, it's always got to be some kind of a useful thing. It's got to have some practical value. I'm not just going to spend my time reading UFO books if I never have a contact experience, or I'm not going to get into the timeline concept and the physics behind it if I don't think that I can somehow apply that knowledge into my own daily life and actually use it to catapult myself and hopefully a bunch of other people into a positive future. Otherwise, what's the point, right? That was the whole gist behind it. So I've been holed up in kind of... Um, Getting into, like you say, creative mode where I, you know, I sometimes I just get up and I never even get out of my underwear. <laughs> it's all day. I'm just working, working, working. And well, it's it's been up and down, I must say. And that's isn't it? I mean, you're 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 a comp I mean, a, a songwriter, composer, musician, um, you know, and, and filmmaker. So so your whole world revolves around this creative process, which when information meets inspiration and momentum and all of a sudden. Uh, this something that wasn't there is born like a song. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, yeah. it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And, and as long as your ego doesn't get in the way of, Oh my God, I did this great thing, but I allow, I allowed this great thing to come through me, which is even more important to me. Yes. And, um, and I so love I, that analogy. Well, to me, that's kind of, you know, there's, there, there's <clears> the two ways of looking at it as a songwriter. I know, you know, if something comes through, you feel it. If you yeah. really, really work hard, I mean, you can write a great song, but it's different. There's just a difference in the two. And for the allowing part, there's a certain level of consciousness or awareness or openness that is required. Um, but you called this, uh, this webinar a tale of two timelines. And I think it's a beautiful title. You know, but again, as a creator, great title is always something I want to know more. And of course, we've talked about timelines a lot. But what do you go into and what can people expect in terms of the scope of these two timelines, learning more and, and you know, maybe come out of um, this webinar with with a greater understanding? What, what are they going to get in, in, in the timelines? Well, the first thing they're going to get is um, is they're going to we're going to we go through the whole the emergence of these looking glass guardians and tying it into what that what does it have to do with the previous looking glass project and just the whole technicality behind like explaining what it is what is this device how does it work where does it come from uh, then you know it, we introduce this whole element of these like I mentioned earlier these J rods which are future humans as crazy as it sounds to some people listening and it's funny because you know john when i was when i was digging back into this material i remember i had this kind of um thought or inspiration when i was 
you know, maybe a lot younger, you know, as a kid, even still, like a, a young adult, where with the whole UFO topic, this suddenly this kind of voice came to me and said, they're not extraterrestrials from another world. They're actually future humans that have figured out how to time travel back to now. And what you find out when you go into this material is indeed, that is, you know, maybe not the entire history of uh, all extraterrestrial interaction is just that, but a very significant and important, and especially relative to the timeline bit, is this future humanity coming back now. And, and it, you end up with, again, with these polarities, which is why it's a tale of two timelines. So there's one timeline which we're on right now, and there's a timeline which, you know, most, most of us probably never, or I, I don't want to generalize, okay, but I think a lot of people were just kind of coasting. And because of this Guardians of the Looking Glass material that dropped and gave us such an intense, like, both negative, like in the extreme, and, and also positive in the extreme picture, it's caused us to maybe, and because so many people watched our first and second interviews or whatever that realized that, wow, there really is like these timeline wars going on. And uh, the other side is definitely making headway very, very quickly. And uh, do we have a timeline that we're focused on? And, you know, and what would that timeline look like? And, and maybe we should start putting some energy into actually creating a positive timeline that we want to have, as opposed to just being non-game players and being sucked into the vortex of a, you know, of this sort of godless, transhumanist, you know, some people even call it antichrist, you know, timeline, uh, and think of a timeline that's going to move us toward our divinity, to, toward the spiritual divinity that we've been, what's been prophesized, and that's been promised, and it's actually part of the divine plan of the universe. So that's one of the things that we're going to get into. Um, we also get into, you know, what the, um, you know, what are the qualities of, we look at the qualities of those two different, so we can identify, because part of what it's about is learning to see the code, if you want to put it that way. If you can recognize the game, and you can see that you are actually investing in the game where maybe you shouldn't be, you need to first understand that game and how to recognize it, and what are those qualities of that game, and contrast that, of course, to what are the, some of the qualities of the of the good game, of the game that you want to be, and what are those aspirations that you should be striving for, what are those goals that maybe we should be having, right? Just to remind ourselves of where we're at, and then you know another part of it is to look at the details of the execution. <laughs> Those people that are executing their, you know, their antichrist transhumanist timeline, uh, what are they? What are the technologies? What are they doing? What are we seeing out there in society that we can recognize so, so we can say, okay, there it is. There's the face of that, you know, and um, so we can, you know, not for the per for the point of getting pulled into the darkness of it, but just so that once we have that image and, and we understand that information, we can absorb it process it and like like I call like light activists out there nowadays we have to be better we have to be on our game we have to take that information process it and dump it and move on because we can't waste energy on the negativity we have to put energy into the positive stuff so that's kind of a nutshell between the crash course you're going to get in the whole kind of a long day sort of a webinar <laughs> in the tale of two timelines I I think this is really exciting and you've literally um in this nutshell little um you know explanation of what the webinar is about touched on so many important things one being and this is a constant question why are we even exploring the negative timeline why are we even looking into the technologies why 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 and and you know i'm sure you talk about this also in the webinar but i think the importance is to understand that the, these entities that are running this negative timeline might not have the level of consciousness you know, that, that a lot of the light activists out there have, but what they do have is extremely uh, developed analytical and observational skills. So, and this is important because what they do is they will observe what is happening in, in the awakening movement and they will mimic it to a certain extent in, in, in a deceptive form. So absolutely. Be, oh, they're talking about the same things. That's actually good. No, no, yes. no. This is the time of deception. We're still in the age of deception. We're moving over into the, we're in this, you know, the pendulum is swinging over to real awakening, but we're still in the age of deception. And so there will be these false prophets that will, they will 
speak the part and they will, you know, and then they will all of a sudden bring in, oh, and let's use this technology and that technology, just a little chip here. And we need to be aware of that so we can always, you know, kind of recalibrate our our compass. And I have loved what you've shared so far in the, in the past interviews, because that to me always engages people in exactly that. How do I recalibrate it? How do I become sharper? How do I become more aware, focused, and then make that switch? Right. I can't wait to dive into uh, the, the webinar. I have to block out a whole day in, in our schedule and calendar, uh, lock the doors, turn off everything else, and just dive into it. Um, because as you know, uh, our wonderful inspired tribe. Frank is not just a great storyteller. He can always back it up with research, with evidence that he's gathered along the way. And one one of the things we talked about, Frank, and I think you also go into is that when we review stuff and information that we researched years and decades ago, all of a sudden that may might not have made a lot of sense back then. We take it into into today's cultural context. We have the words. We have the experiences around us and all of a sudden we go, oh, my God, I can't believe I couldn't see it before, but now I can see it. Um, is there, Did you yeah. have a lot of aha moments like that when you put it all together? Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there was on the one hand, there was some stuff, for example, we have um, when we made Packing for Mars, the, the, the original cut was a lot longer and parts unfortunately i had to take out <laughs> so and one of those parts is it's just i found um they were talking about um you know i'm not going to give too much away here because i want it to be kind of a surprise but there was some information that they were talking about happening um and and that was being shared with a particular president and what ends up happening is that that information is the basis for a lot of this j-rod material Without it, without my even knowing it 12 years ago, and I'm sure without, it was, I think it was Richard Dolan, without him even knowing about what he was talking about, now that I look back and I, I went back and pulled all this material back out and put it all out and looked at it, I'm realizing, oh my God, it's like that piece was there the whole time and I never even realized it. And only now does it make any sense. And um, the other thing is that it's these sync points, like this, like another example, People, there's this thing like Jesus says, we, we're supposed to be like children, right, to get into heaven. Well, for me, that's taken on another meaning now because, because of what something, uh, there's, this, um, there's this Greek woman, her name is uh, Corinna Limniodi, I hope I'm not butchering her name, but she actually put together a video, uh, we did an interview and she put together a video about uh, for calling all light activists and walk-ins in particular, because she's a walk-in. I don't know if you know what walk-ins are, yeah, but, but maybe right? and, explain what a walk-in is. Really. Right. And we talked about what is a, what is a walk-in and a walk-in is actually, it's different from somebody who's consciously, who wakes up, you know, who's, li who's grown up in the world and as from a kid to an adult and has layers of all this conditioning to peel off like onion layers, you know, and that's what happens to most people that are going through the wake up process. A walk-in is somebody that walks in like literally there's an exchange where a soul will make an agreement with another soul to vacate that body and let that, it could be as a, as a result of an accident or an illness or, you know, maybe a terminal illness and they were leaving. But another entity came in and said, you know what, I, I'm, I've got a mission. I'm coming in, I'm going to take over and I'll carry on the mission from here. And, and, and they come to the earth. I, be, sorry for interrupting. I know no quite a few people where I have experienced this walk-in, this soul shift, the swap. Um, and and you you can totally tell. It's when a person overnight changes to an extent yes. that you cannot explain. Right. And so she did this video calling all these uh, in because she wants to pull them together. And, it, and I was thinking about like that saying, Jesus, be like children, right? Uh, what does it mean to be like a child? Well, what are children? Children are not yet com like completely inundated with all this garbage in the world. They haven't had these layers, onion layers to put on themselves yet. To So they see clearly, they see the truth clearly. That's why it's always, you know, parents with their kids in the shopping mart, mommy, look at that fat person or something, right? It's like, there's this, you know, embarrassment because the kid just sees it and calls it what it is. 
and and so to be like children in that sense to me me it's like this has taken on a new definition we also have people in uh, you know in involved in um you know teleportation experiments that took place where they use children be why because children were not were able to readily step into like the chronovisor environment and go wow check out this you know this and that and just see what they were just observing and they would bring back accurate accounts whereas if it was one an adult with layers they'd go in and go oh my god that couldn't be because i've heard this and that you know in the history books it says that person wasn't you know it just there's all these layers that come in the way so the information isn't clean so you know, this is uh, this is something which has become very important to me. And so, looking at this information, um, and plus, you know, I can put up a couple. We can put up. A, I think we should look at a couple of these um, quotes, like because, as you know, I, I told you that I've been working on a uh, a series, a web series with a biophysicist in Germany called Dieter Brers, and it's about. Um, it's called probable futures or possible futures, and it's about and we bring in information uh, from instrumental transcommunication, for example, which is communication that has happened that's taken place between people in our dimension inside of Faraday cages that are completely sealed off from the outside, where entities would speak through onto tape machines or onto recording devices and give concrete messages. And some of these messages are just, I think we showed a couple on one of the other shows we did. They're just mind blowing. And, you know, so because I've been doing this with, with Dieter, I'm getting exposure to all those bits of information as well, which are deriving from the un most unusual ways. And one of the things that I, what I wrote down is that I wanted to mention is that what separates us from artificial intelligence, because everyone in the transhumanist world is, is like, hard pitching us on how amazing these computers are going to be there are thousands of times smarter than we are and essentially all they're doing is they're grabbing their information from databases and they just have incredibly powerful computing abilities uh, way more than we have but i mean they're limited to getting their information from hard drives where do we get our information we're humans we're actually connected to the universe we're creator beings you know gods with a small g if you want and our database is much more dynamic. You know, we don't need to go to a hard drive. I mean, we can. I have a lot of stuff on my hard drive that I pulled into this project, for example. But I can also, you know, get that information from other sources. And one of those sources is things like spirits that are in interdimensional. And or they're or giving the us... The Chronicles or the morphogenetic field where everything that's ever been thought, ever been uh, projected is, is yes. available. So we have this ability. Yes. Now. Yes, exactly. And there's a science behind that. And, and you made a good point before, and I wanted to also bring that up because a lot of the information that I'm putting into this webinar isn't just, it's on the one hand, yeah, like it's very similar to writing songs, I got to say, because like I have this, at first, this frustrating experience of a mountain of data, and I'm going like, okay, what am I going to do for the part one, right? And then I have this data, and I'm like, I, I spend like a couple of days in absolute frustration, how am I going to organize it? And then all of a sudden, I get the thread. And then I just piece it together and it just flows. And then all this stuff flows through on top of it, this, this extra, you know, icing on the cake. And, and so it's, it's basically, you know, when you, when you put that, all those different elements together, you get a, a much more dynamic information exchange because you find out that interdimensional entities that were giving us messages back in the 1990s or even 80s, <laughs> When you, when you read that text, it's very, very technical in a way, especially for that time. The language, you know, wasn't really, quantum physics hasn't really made its big entry into our world maybe in the last 10, 20 years only, really. But, but before that, it was still like voodoo for most people. And the language that was coming through is speaking on those levels. And if you read that language now and you find those messages now and you put them into the context of looking glass technology and future humans coming back to try and change the timeline for a specific purpose. What are those purposes? Wow. It's just mind blowing, really mind blowing. So are, do you, you want to share some of those? Uh, yes. Let's, let's those put on a couple of those quotes here. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Here, I'll put this one on. This is, this is a message from the J rods, the mm -hmm. future humans. From the positive there's there's a couple of factions of these j-rods out there and you know we'll explain all that in the webinar like why are there positives and negatives but there always seem to be in this case th this is a message coming from one of the positives if we solve the challenges of compassion and inclusion of sensitivity and courage 
and we dismantle the artificial stargates that are a symptom of an overload of arrogance. We then avert a planetary system overload. Things go more smoothly, and the natural stargate activation becomes all the more wonderful an opportunity for awakening and vitalizing. A new, untrammeled future, an undiscovered new world where instead of a catastrophe befalling our arrogance, there is, in contrast, a grand renaissance of spiritual awakening that heralds a bright future that is newly born. Oh, and, and the language is beautiful. It's it's really beautiful. Awesome, right? Yeah, it's... it's right, okay. Then it, there's another one here. Check this one out. Right now is the time to make the difference by walking, by waking up from our slumber and begin to realize how we have our individual <clears throat> and collective strong mass quantum probabilities associated with and invested in several different distinct futures. Right now... Remember, this, this comes from almost 20 years ago. Back then, nobody would have known what this is all about, right? And there's a third one that really goes well with this too that I wanted to put in. It is our natural human potential as human beings to be completely connected with the Creator God, to consciously accept the invitation from the universe, every living thing, every changing thing, and all the beauty and chaos within the whole and all its parts. It is not only our birthright, it is our invited responsibility to wake up now and make the coming natural stargate quantum blue apple life vortical reality boosting events occur to our maximum evolutionary benefit. <laughs> you, you know what I love about these messages is they always come fully entail free will. It is always yeah. an inviting spirit, but it never say we must or we die. But it is, this is the potential that we actually hold. This is what's so beautiful for me to, when I hear this. Well, I mean, it's, um, it's interesting. The blue apple thing is interesting because the blue apple thing ties into, if you do some research on it, you just find out that the blue apple ultimately means the grail. <clears throat> it's that connection that we have as individual stargates to the greater universe. And there's science behind that. I mean, like, for example, if you look at... Um, the fact that our human brain is an interferometer. I bet most people listening had no clue, right? And and basically, it means that infer, 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 uh, interferometry is kind of when, when waves come together and are superimposed, where they cross at a specific point, it opens a gateway into another dimension. So we are actually wired to be able to download and get this information like we're not only transmitters we're receivers of scalar waves and scalar waves are the method that this spiritual information travels on it's not measurable Sp scalar waves are outside of the dimensions that's why you know scalar wave uh, science is still very very new and nebulous people don't really understand what scalar waves are tesla was working with scalar waves and um th because they're not really measurable the, the only thing you can measure about scalar waves is their effect. In fact, here I'll put another quote because actually these entities, these um, other interdimensional messages talk specifically about scalar waves. It blew my mind when I found this. Okay, I'll put this on to the last couple of quotes. It's talking about us as frequency anchors. <clears throat> this is from what I got. This is from me and Dieter Burrs just did a, a, a new show on possible futures just this last weekend. And this is, nobody's ever heard this before. And of course, not everybody is, not everything is predetermined. There are chaotic factors that are left to free will. Some, some hyperdimensional forces, aware of the coming shift, are banking on the suppression of mass frequencies to lead humanity into a likely future where these forces harvest maximum energy and maintain control, whether in this density or the next. This can include everything from mass loss of life to genetic assimilation and spiritual enslavement. And it goes on, to some extent, this has already happened. I mean, we're talking about the Klaus Schwab Club, right? And the world as we now know it today is the end result of the recent revision of the timeline. I mean, they were saying this already back then. And yet time marches on and the final future is still open. This brings us to what we can do as individuals. The wiser sources say we should just be ourselves, remember who we are, and radiate the essence of our soul. In fact, we are all frequency anchors. And um, 
The next one, not only in our world, but also in your matrix of existence, realities can be thought of once one has found the necessary starting conditions for them and has set them on the way. And this is the cool part. As soon as such new realities have become conscious of themselves and have taken up relations to other forms of consciousness, they can no longer be made to undone or disappear. And the final one, our respective thoughts are similar to vectorial streams that flow in various directions and can unite with other streams and also specifically react to the similarity or resonance with other thought streams. There are no units of measurement for spirit, but there are directions. Thus, at the same time, we are also a scalar field that cannot be measured, but still exerts its effects in unfolding. I mean, it's all there. <clears throat> very, you know, very powerful. We, you know, we have the ability, there is a force out there which is trying to harvest our energy. We know that. But to put it in these terms, in terms of, yes, it's out there, but no one's talking about this on a spiritual level. What it means is, yes, on a spirit, we've given them our energy. We don't have to, but we do. Thank you. Right? We don't have to. It's, it's, you can only, and this is what, what is the message is really, it cannot be really taken from you. You have to give it, whether you know that you give it or not, because you believe it's the only way that that's a different story, but you have to voluntarily give it. There's no other way. Exactly. Like, like when you receive messages from behind the veil or, or through the mansion, it's the same thing. You have to open yourself up. You cannot just be hijacked. There has to be some sort of agreement to receiving a message. And I've, because I've been doing it for so long, the receiving, I also know that you are the filter too. You can decide what kind of entities of what kind of frequencies you want to actually receive or not. But uh, uh, I want to say something because what you explained with the brainwaves and which, which is very technical, it's actually, I'm, I, you know, it's actually a lot of people know the experience. If for some reason, whether through meditation or you're just in a relaxed state or you're, you could be sitting in a parking lot and waiting, whatever, and you're just, you're just chill. And all of a sudden a clarity comes to you and something you saw in one way, you can now instantaneously seen another way that is when you're hit by those waves and you actually allow it and clarity and a new sense of truth comes to you that's what happens and that is why they are constantly trying to occupy our minds and keeping them busy and interpreting reality for us so we don't open our minds to actually perceiving greater truth that's the whole name of the game and i think man Frank, you've just hit on a couple of very important points we should talk about still because uh, you know you were talking about meditation and what i was showing you with that picture with the brain is it's it's the scientific it's the science behind why meditation works and you know you don't have to really understand the science behind it all i wanted to do is just show you that there really is uh, a physical effect that you know we are in physical we've adopted the matrix as our temporary homes we've accepted certain physical laws as the rules of engagement and we don't we only know a very very small part of those laws and those rules because we've been kept very limited in our school system in terms of what science is what is physics and you know the real science is being done not in the universities but in behind closed doors and private black ops industries um, and the fact is that our brains are connected through specific frequencies the frequency that you're referring to in meditation is like an alpha frequency it's, and, and our brains have somewhere between 1 and 10 hertz. We have various levels of alpha. And, you know, the ideal state is one where you're still conscious, but, you know, you're sort of almost in the, in the next, like, the dream dimension, the dream world. Um, and I wanted to, you know, mention this because what's happening right now is um, a lot of, we talked about CERN a lot. And, you know, we talked about the fact that they restarted CERN and they've calibrated it to be far more powerful. And this is an important thing to be aware of, because let me just show you this. 
this is essentially, uh, there, you know, there, there are people that are analyzing the Schumann resonances daily. Mm-hmm. And they've also, they're also um, putting them up against, on the, on the left side of this picture here, you see essentially um, the beam set up, the injection probe beam at CERN that's happening right now. This is from the 6th of May. And I, we talked about that last time, how they've ramped it up and they're scaling it up and they're ramping it up to over 12 trillion electron volts. No, ne- there's never been as much energy focused on one part of the planet in the history of, of our, well, in our, in our history, let's say. Um, and you can see in this diagram, the little circle here, this is exactly you know, when it was measured that they ramped it up. And, and at the same time, you can see here on the Schumann resonance measurements, this white line here is essentially where the um, amplitude of the frequencies just gets fried. I mean, the instruments can no longer even measure mm-hmm. the, 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 the frequencies. And when you see a lot of these... Um, pictures that are circulating around the web where people are saying, wow, look at that, the Schumann frequencies, you know, we're being fired up, this is cool. No, it's not. What they're doing is they're slamming into the, they've got, they've built um, a shield around the ionosphere, very, very high up that lasts for months. And they are using that to experiment with HARP. And when they begin to fire up the Schumann resonances like that, they are they know that our human brains are tied exactly specifically into eight hertz, fourteen hertz, thirty. There's there's certain harmonics in our waking state. We operate more on the twenty hertz, the thirty hertz, and you know in our sleeping state we're down between one and eight. And and so our brains are hardwired to lock into those Schumann resonances. So they know that by playing with them. What they're doing is they're taking away, if we can never come to rest, because like you described, when you're sitting in that state of meditation and you've got this tool, your brain with two hemispheres, and it's accepting these waves coming from the universe, uh, but you can't get to eight hertz because it's just being like hot wired by the people at CERN. You know, maybe not continuously, but more and more and more. In fact, they're now building one in China, which is going to be 30 times, uh, 30 tera, uh, trillion volts, right? I mean, they're just, they're just never going to stop before they, until they blow it all up. I don't know, but we have to stop them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we have to be aware that this is going on. So you have to find a way to shield your environment from this stuff. So if, you know, you just have to be aware that it's happening and not just be out there you know, to, to be promoting this stuff out there saying this is a good thing is a mistake. It's giving them, they're giving you the wrong information and they're using your goodwill and your desire to turn other people on to good information and your ignorance of the truth to work against you. This is a perfect example of how you can be used even though you're good willing and your heart's in the right place and you want to put the information out there, you, you just don't know, you know, you just don't know the truth behind it. And, and, and this is why we have been emphasizing lately that it's such a time of being a very, very focused and being almost laser sharp. And, and this is, I understand that people say, well, I've been working hard all my life. Now all I want to do is relax. And relaxing is part of this hyper focus. But what I mean by this is um, our awareness needs to be sharpened like the sharpest pencil you could think of right now because of the level of deception. But the level of deception is also so high because we're, we're walking this edge right now. And when we get on at, to the end of this edge, we, it will be determined if we can, if we're powerful enough to really bring about this timeline, which I think we are. But the truth is a lot of people experience this. They go to bed and they're kind of, um, you know, still awake, can't go to sleep, but then they wake up after six, seven hours and they're tired, which they shouldn't be. And this part of it is because of this smog of frequencies and because they're doing, yeah. I mean, you have to understand anything that they can do, they will do. So if Absolutely. you're holding back in your own powers, then you're not giving yourself the best possible chance. So this also means, and how do you protect it? Aside from physical stuff that you can use, we have used this for many, many years. You can actually intend to create a protective layer around you or your house. You can literally go into a deeper state of meditation, put it in a frequency bubble, and you determine what kind of frequencies you allow through. You can, but you have to be specifically focused and you have to have a certain level of um, speed of thought to make it happen. But if you can truly imagine it and if you set the intention and if you 
cemented into reality, then you are protected. That's how people like uh, not to throw names out, but people like David Icke that have been so often, you know, 20 years ahead and have been hidden so hard against these entities are still around. They people like David Icke know how to do this. We've been doing it. You should be doing it. You can protect yourself because everything they use technology for, you don't have to use technology for. That's the truth. We have it within us. So you can do this. You can protect yourself. Absolutely. And I think you can, that's an excellent point. You can just be aware and know that as much as you're inside this matrix, you're actually not just inside this matrix. You actually do exist outside of this matrix, like the blue apples thing. You know, it's there's these vortal stargates. They're like black holes. You know, uh, Nassim Harriman talks about them in everything, in the, sm- in the tiniest atoms. In the center of an atom is like a black hole. And these are everywhere and they're inside of us. And so we actually are like directly always connected to these higher dimensions. And if we are aware of that and we know that, um, you know, we can't be, we can't be destroyed. You know, we are really like in the sense, um, yeah, we're, we can't not be ever because there is no such thing as not being, you know. And, and so just knowing that we have the ability to you know, admit to ourselves, yes, we're in the matrix, but at the same time, we're not in the matrix. We're, we're hooked up to our own, okay, maybe it isn't the tube in the back of our head like in the film, but that symbolizes us being connected to our higher sources, higher, our higher soul. Uh, and that's really where we should be steering um, our intention from. Now, those who are waking up, at least, not everybody maybe will do it. And, you know, there's a, God forbid, there's a lot of <laughs> ignorant people out there in the world, unconscious. And they just are. They're going to be unconscious and, they're, and we can't change that. But we don't need all of us to wake up to make a strong enough connection to this other. And that's some of the things that we really get into in the, in the webinar with, with um, this doctrine of uh, co- you know, a convergent timeline paradox, which is like saying there's, yes, there's this dark stuff, but <laughs> always there's this way out. And how does that work? How can we describe it? And it's always just, just going to help us to, to find the way to feel grounded and fearless in the world that we're in. And that's the best thing we can do. And then we can visualize that timeline the way we want it. You know, what does your timeline look like? You know, my timeline there's an avocado tree out the window, maybe, or my best friends are within shouting distance and we hug, hug each other every day. Uh, and there's, you know, there's free energy devices every every day that are not harmful to the to the uh, environment that are, you know, tapping into a, a natural form of cohesion with the universe. And so there's no more pollution. And so those are the kinds of things that I see and that I've seen for many, many years and I've wished for. And I hope that they finally get here and the more of us that do that the more of us like it was saying we're frequency anchors that was one of those screens right we are putting ourselves in that frequency of joy and and love and happiness and excitement and if we you know in as much as that i'm not immune to being down and (laughs) depressed i'll be the first one to admit that but not always you know there are times where and you realize that when you're in a dark space you realize okay it's temporary, and in a sense, how much longer are you going to fool yourself that you're just this limited being? It's not going to last very long if you think of it that way. And then when you pull out of it, you get a boost, and you, you connect to that joy of being on a higher conscious being. So it doesn't need all of us to to, to make that awareness happen. It just needs a, a critical mass, let's say. And I think that's why, um, you know, Corinna, I was mentioning that I did this video, she's calling out for the walk-ins to come together, and other people are doing it in their way. The time is now for us to make, and it's like those messages said, it's now. We have to start. We can't wait, you know, forever. How much longer are we going to wait? You know, the train's leaving the train station, right? I'm in full agreement, Frank. And I want to I want to call this conversation the biggest leap yet that we have made together in any conversation, I believe, the biggest leap yet. Uh, I encourage everyone for various reasons, because I have come to trust in Frank's work very much. I've come to trust the soul that I'm communicating with very much. So I encourage everyone to, uh, you know, go to the link that we're going to share everywhere here and, um, and sign up for the tale, a tale of two timelines, Frank's webinar, which they can watch at their own pace and time. I understand. Right, Frank. You don't need to binge watch it. No, actually, okay. <laughs> but you can, if you like binge watching, but I suggest taking breaks, you know, spread it out. Yeah. There's a <laughs> lot of information in every single one. It's like really super packed. I got to say. 
Wonderful. So yeah, please go go over there again. The links will be everywhere. A Tale of Two Timelines by Frank Jacob. Thank you so much for being here once again uh, with us, Frank. As I said, the biggest sleep yet. And um, to all our viewers, be, be always know that these conversations don't just happen between two people. It's the intentions involved. It's the awareness involved, the consciousness that you bring to this. And together we are every time creating a new leap moving forward in, in a timeline that we desire to create. That's really the important message here. And if along these steps, there will be new information revealed, maybe by the guardians of the looking glass, or there will be something, we will share it. Never as fanboys, like Frank said, but always to contribute to the greater picture and bring greater clarity to something. And this is really so important. It always leads back to us, not us, Frank and me, but us, all of us to our own true connection. Um, Frank, thank you for your wisdom. Uh, fr thank you for your research. Thank you for your material. Thank you for this beautiful conversation. I really, really appreciate it. As always a pleasure with you, John. Every time we talk, I, I think we reach new levels of communication and it's just such a pleasure. <clears throat> yes, indeed. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Inspired Tribe. We love you. We appreciate you. And we'll be back with you very, very soon.